Hello fans of history, and welcome to this video that explores the intriguing love life of Henry VIII, and the effects that it will have on the Protestant Reformation in England, which may bring up the question, is all fair in love and religious war? Well, there is much more at stake for England than just a scandalous king and his saucy little minxes. Instead, the European balance of power may be at stake here as well. While Henry's actions certainly must have upset the Pope in Rome and the Catholics in his realm, might Henry's actions have also been for the betterment of the stability of the state? Well, let's take a look here and see. First of all, some fun facts about Henry VIII, in case you're wondering. He was crowned at the age of 17, and then when being crowned, he had a purge of many of his father's tax collectors, had them beheaded upon his assuming the throne. Why? Well, he couldn't really trust all of them. Some of them were left over from the English War of the Roses, which was a civil war that happened because of a failure of the uh, Yorkists to come up with a legitimate heir. And so this could have been his version of trying to solidify his realm and make sure that no one was getting in his way. Another fun fact about him is that he was known upon assuming the throne as the Good Scholar, or Henry Beauclerc, if my French isn't too terrible. And uh, this is because he received one of the best humanist educations in the world, at least for European monarchs at this time and uh, was very, you know, he was, he was a very learned man. He was the kind of guy you could trust with a book, but that might come back to bite him here. Another thing that's kind of neat about him is that he expanded the navy during his realm from only three English major warships to over 50 major warships, all right? And that is pretty impressive because that is a nearly 1,500% increase in naval power. Definitely going to help him here in the religious wars to come, especially for his daughter Elizabeth when she becomes queen, going against the most fortunate fleet, the Spanish Armada. Now, of course, this costs a lot of money, and so he's going to develop a rather negative nickname amongst his people of Old Copper Nose. The reason this will happen is because since he's got so much gold that he owes for wars, whether it be building his ships or for the unending wars uh, against both Spain and France and with the HRE later as well. Because of all of these wars, he had to devalue his currency uh, by adding uh, less precious metals like copper to his coins. And therefore, many people start to call him Old Copper Nose because whose mug was on the devalued coin containing copper? None other than Henry Blochler. All right. Another uh, fun thing that comes about at the be very beginning of his reign here is the issue of a Game of Thrones going on in Europe. You see, Henry VIII is a young king at this time. Another young king at this time is Charles V, or Carlos V of Spain, and he is uh, up for nomination for the throne of the Holy Roman Empire, as is Henry VIII of England as is Francis I of France. So all of these three young men are up for the crown of the HRE. Now, um, they're waiting to see what the seven electors will decide, but at one point, Francis, trying to be amicable with the other potential leaders of the most powerful um, uh, area of Europe, is going to say, we are two gallants courting the same mistress, and he who fails will have no excuse for ill temper. What a nice guy, right? Seems all good and happy. Yay, we'll all be friends after this. Nah, it'll be anything but that. Because really, Francis realizes that this is about the struggle for the balance of power in Europe. All right, so Francis is going to be caught in the middle of whichever king takes the throne of the HRE. If it's not him, it's either going to be England, who may want to unite the realms between the HRE and uh, their realm in the British Isles, or it could be Carlos in Spain. Now, Carlos in Spain is the more dangerous of the two adversaries here because Spain has a bigger army. Uh, Henry does not. So Carlos definitely is going to try to take out France and usurp it into the expanding empire, the largest empire in Europe at the moment. And plus, he's got the New World. So this balance of power is freaking Francis out. So what he's going to do is actually invite the young Henry VIII to come hang out with him at Calais in a little battle royale that will develop in what was called the Field of Cloth and Gold. Now, it all started out as a fun diplomatic mission where they go and they party for a while, but Francis uh, decided to get rid of diplomacy, typical diplomacy and formality, and instead of having diplomats do most of the talking, he and Henry would drink together and talk and often exchange strong words. Now, at one point, Francis is going to propose that the two of them, the two kings, 
uh, engage in a battle royale with a wrestling bout. So they'll get down to their skivvies and take each other on in the golden tent and wrestle. And in all of these different wrestling bouts and different tests of physical skill, Henry's going to lose. So Henry doesn't lose well. He's got a lot of pride. He's pretty vain. And after all of this, he'll end up bankrupt because he took such a huge group of courtiers to go party in France. This is not good for him. So all of this is important, though, as we consider the next movie he's going to make, dealing with religion. Remember that we're in the midst of the Protestant Reformation. We've got Luther's ideas running amok, so to speak, over in Europe, running amok if you're Catholic, that is, and uh, changing the European balance of power already due to religion. Now, what will Henry do? Let's take a look at a lovely documentary here from David Starkey and the BBC. On the 19th of May, 1536, at the Tower of London, Anne Boleyn, Queen of England, mounted the scaffold. Her last words were about King Henry VIII, the husband who had had her condemned to death on trumped-up charges of adultery and incest. Under such circumstances, what she said was extraordinary. I cry mercy to God and to the king. And I beg the people to pray for the king. For he is a good, gentle, gracious and amiable prince. Once indeed, Henry had been gracious and gentle. But his steely determination to divorce his first wife and to marry Anne, which Anne herself had encouraged and inspired, had coarsened and brutalised him. Anne had helped to create a new Henry who would change England forever. Now she was to be one of his first victims. How fun. So just a nice little introduction into the things that are to come here. Let's take a look at Henry's love life and how that's going to affect European politics and also, of course, European religion. Um, so uh, Henry, in 1521, after Luther made his break with Rome officially, after he'd been excommunicated, he'd published his 95 Theses uh, four years earlier. He's excommunicated at this point, and uh, his ideas are spreading as a heresy, according to the Catholic Church and their uh, devout followers. So Henry was a devout follower at the time, and he was uh, writing several letters and publishing them across Europe, written in Latin, of course, saying that uh, Martin Luther is a heretic, must be condemned, his ideas must be stopped at all costs because of the effect they could have upon Europe. And so he was labeled by the Pope at the time, the defender of the faith. Ironic, given that he will end up forming his own faith here very quickly. Now, the reason he's going to go and end up forming his own faith is because of his complicated love life. You see, Henry at the time was married to Catherine of Aragon, who was his first wife, and she will end up becoming the, Mary, the mother of Mary I, Queen Mary I. So Queen Catherine of Aragon uh, was supposed to be married to Henry's eldest brother. All right, so Henry VIII had a brother by the name of Arthur. Arthur was supposed to marry Catherine, who was the youngest daughter of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. So she came over in 1501 as a 16-year-old girl. She ends up uh, being married to Arthur, but Arthur dies before he can become king. And so in order to legitimize the crown and in order to uh, uh, prevent another violent war for the succession of who deserves to be king, Henry ends up marrying his brother's sister, Catherine. And so they were unable to conceive. And by 1527, uh, Henry's starting to have some serious doubts about his marriage to Catherine. He actually believed that he had no sons with her because God was punishing him for having married his brother's wife. Yes, they had a daughter, but of course, that's not good enough at the time, unfortunately for him. So he actually found a passage in the Bible that backed his belief. And then he sends this to the Pope saying, hey, by the way, this is uh, no longer a legitimate marriage. You need to annul this marriage. Now, an annulment means that it was never consummated, which is obviously false because they have a child together. And the other problem 
is that Catherine, it, who is an older woman, older than Henry, ends up hitting her time in her life when she is no longer able to have children. She's going through the change, and so therefore, uh, that means that Henry will have no legitimate son. Meanwhile, we've got those Boleyn girls running around. Now you see, Anne Boleyn, who was born in 1501, so she's 16 years younger than his current wife, so... Another thing is that at the age of 14, she was sent with her sister, Mary, to the French court as a maid to the Queen of France. Her name was Queen Claude. So she returned to England in 1522, and she attracted the attention of many admirers. Now, uh, the king uh, seemed to like both sisters because he had already struck up the attention uh, or struck up a relationship with Mary, who had attracted his attention first, Mary Boleyn. All right, so Mary Boleyn, though, uh, he ends up losing interest with her and starts to gain interest with Anne. Anne is flaunting herself a little bit around him, but at the same time, she doesn't want to have any much to do with him because of the fact that, number one, he's a married man and she doesn't want to just be some mistress. Number two, she actually had a marriage lined up with a guy named the Duke of Umbridge, and she was pretty excited about that because she kind of liked the guy. He was from a good family, wasn't going to require her to be some nasty mistress, but at the same time, it wasn't quite good enough uh, because when the king has something that he wants, he gets it. So the king is going to end up, number one, uh, he's going to end up talking to the Pope and to Cardinal Wolseley in England to see if they can figure out a way to get an annulment. So Cardinal Wolseley, who, by the way, wants to be Pope. He wants to be the next pope, if possible. He's trying to do everything he can to micromanage things in England so that later he can be pope. It's going to come back to get him in the end. Uh, he will not, of course, be pope. Instead, he's going to lead to uh, a reformation in England. So Cardinal Wolseley is trying to orchestrate the legal proceedings, but the problems that he's having here are that uh, the, the pope that was around when Henry married Catherine, his name was Julius II, so Julius II is dead now, but Julius II had to give a special dispensation or special permission, basically, for Henry and Catherine to be married in the first place, because after all, Henry was marrying his brother's wife, and that was not exactly legal in the church. And then while all of this is going on, Clement VII, who's the current pope, is trying to deal with the Lutheran heresy as they see it, and uh, if Luther is saying that the pope is, in, is not infallible, that he makes mistakes, that we don't have to trust him, and then suddenly Clement says, yeah, that former pope made a mistake. You don't have to trust him. I will give you the annulment. That's going to make the entire Catholic Church look bad and send many more people potentially flocking to Luther. So therefore, Henry's caught in a bad spot there as well. Another bad spot for the pope is that he is currently under house arrest by Carlos V of Spain, who happens to be Catherine's nephew. All right, so uh, he's he's in ha under house arrest. Rome has been sacked. A Spanish army sitting in Rome, hanging out, partying. There's no way that the Pope can give an annulment to Henry, even though normally he would. But under these conditions, there's just no way that he can. So in that case, um, it's just not going to happen. Plus, Henry's dealing with divided opinions within England itself. His best friend, Sir Thomas More, his schoolmate and learned friend, humanist scholar Sir, Sir Thomas More, is trying to argue to him, this is not legal. You can't do it. I mean, it's one thing to have a mistress, Henry. I feel you, bro. But there, you, there's no way that this is going to be legal. You're breaking from the church in Rome illegally if you decide to do this. And you can't get a divorce unless it's legal. That will illegitimize your authority as king. So... Henry's going to try and make it seem like this is actually theological, that it goes back to the Bible saying that he has every right to do this until his love letters to Anne get exposed. He and Anne had some saucy love letters going back and forth showing it's not just about theology. Henry might be thinking with his pants. Henry himself seemed increasingly unworried by the threat of excommunication. Even if His Holiness should do his worst by excommunicating me and so forth, I shall not mind it. If I care not a fig for all his excommunications, let him follow his own at Rome. I will do here what I think best. 
Once, Henry assembled a team of scholars like Thomas More to help him defend papal power in his book, The Assertio. Now, a similar effort was mounted once again, this time to question the Pope's authority. And the evidence for that effort can still be found here in the British Library. We can see Henry's method in this book, the Collectania Satis Corpiosa, which can be loosely translated as the collection that says it all. It's a compendium, assembled for Henry in 1530 and drawn from a wide range of sources, English history, Anglo-Saxon law and the Old Testament but they all add up to make the case, however tendentiously, that the Pope's rule over the English church was a usurpation of what had once been an independent, self-governing national church. Henry went through the Collectania with enormous care. It has over 40 marginal notes in his own hand. By the time he'd finished, he'd convinced himself that the Pope in Rome had no legitimate authority in England. Instead, it was Henry as king who was rightful head of the English church. Now, as touching schism, we are informed by virtuous and learned men that considering what the Church of Rome is, it is no schism to separate from it and adhere to the words of God. The lives of Christ and the Pope are very opposite. Therefore, to follow the Pope is to forsake Christ. Henry, the theologian and amateur scholar, had convinced himself. Now, Henry the politician had to persuade others. This book, The Glass of the Truth, published by the King's Printer in 1531, was part of a sustained propaganda campaign by which Henry sought to persuade the English people that they should reject any foreign jurisdiction, whether of emperor or, in particular, of the Pope. It was the birth of English Euroscepticism, the King's takeover of the Church, framed as an assertion of national sovereignty. And, by and large, it worked. The next year, Henry's new minister, Thomas Cromwell, a former protégé of Wolsey, who had stepped into his dead master's shoes, steered legislation through Parliament that forbade all appeals to the Pope, making the king, in effect, the final religious authority in England. Now, confident that Rome could no longer undo anything decided in an English court, Henry instructed his hand-picked Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, to make a third trial of his marriage. The result was truly a foregone conclusion, since by the time that Cranmer got round to declaring Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon invalid, Henry had already married Anne Boleyn in secret, and probably twice over, just to make sure. This was the final open breach with Rome, and it marks the watershed in Henry's reign and England's history. For a thousand years, whilst kings had ruled their subjects' bodies, popes had ruled their souls. Now, Henry claimed authority over both. With new legislation, which explicitly made the king supreme head of the church in England, Henry rose to a pinnacle of power unprecedented in Christendom, a power which none of his subjects would be permitted to question even to doubt. All had now to swear an oath to uphold the royal supremacy, and it was treason to refuse to do so. Wheresoever any such cankered malice shall either chance to break out, or any to be accused thereof, His Highness would have the same tried and thoroughly pursued with as great dexterity and as little favour as their demerits should require. No mercy was shown, not even to Henry's old friend, Thomas More. The act of Parliament is like a sword with two edges. 
For if a man answer one way, it will confound his soul, and if he answer the other way, it will confound his body. Maul refused to accept the supremacy. He kept his soul, but it cost him his head. Though the king is by nature kind and generously inclined, this Anne has so perverted him that he does not seem the same man. Henry had come a long way from the Assertio and his old friends. He had embarked on the journey out of love for Anne and the determination to marry her. At first, he thought it would be relatively easy to get what he wanted. But Catherine's resistance and Rome's reluctance steadily raised the stakes until the most fundamental questions of church and state were involved. Few of Henry's family and friends were prepared to follow him. Like Moore, the parting of the ways was a matter of conscience and profound regret. But for Henry, it was treason. And Anne, equally outraged, was on hand to fan the flames of his resentment and turn him like a kneeled steel into something harder, colder, and more brutal than before. All right, as you saw, this is a sword with two edges. Great quote from Sir Thomas More. We're going to fast forward a little bit here to, to take a look at what happens in Parliament. Parliament will pass the Act of Supremacy by 1534. They're called the Reformation Parliaments because several parliaments will gather to discuss and debate these. Now, you might be wondering, what's, what's the deal with Wolseley? Where's Wolseley fit into all this after the, um, or as this is getting passed? Because he would have stood against it. He was not a fan of what he saw happening in the Act of Supremacy and in the Reformation Parliaments because, again, he wants to be Pope in Rome. And so he's very much worried about this, right? So Henry will end up having to um, dismiss Cardinal Wolseley because Anne Boleyn hated Wolseley. And she had a growing faction within the government and, of course, had Henry's ear and other things uh, in his attention. And so she was able to convince Henry that Wolseley was a traitor that he was deliberately trying to slow this process to prevent them from getting married. By the way, the whole reason that she is uh, saying these things is because of the fact that Wolseley was the one that made sure that the Duke of Umbridge did not marry Anne. He was the one that orchestrated all of this stuff to make sure that Anne did not get to marry the first love of her life, and she hated him ever since. Basically, they just bought off the Duke of Umbridge. He was like, great, give me a castle and I'm cool. But that's not how, how Anne took it. She was upset. And so Cardinal Wolseley will be um, dismissed. He'll be allowed to, uh, uh, to leave for a little while, while, and he'll have to sacrifice his palace of Westminster, which is where Henry will set himself up in the Westminster Castle as his London residence. And it will be, by the way, one of 72 homes that Henry will have over the course of his reign as king. He moved like every three months because he had so many homes. Anyway, just a fun fact about him. While Wolseley is being dismissed, we're getting some new guys. Also, Sir Thomas More, of course, is going to be dismissed and he is going to be killed by beheading for treason. And so he, as the uh, chief minister to the king, is gone and we get Thomas Cromwell instead. We get Tr Thomas Cranmer as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. Wolseley will end up being sent away for a while and then recalled in November of 1530 to, uh, to defend himself against treason charges, but he will die en route from natural causes potentially, but also the fact that he probably was so stressed out about the whole thing. He said in his dying words, I see the matter against me how it is framed, but if I had served God as diligently as I had have done the king, he would not have given me over in my gray hairs. Essentially saying, man, if I'd just done a better job for God and not the king, maybe I could have lived longer. Maybe things could have been differently. All right, but the Church of England is going to separate as a result of everything that was happening there. They'll have an oath of allegiance, which, as Thomas More indicated, will be confounding souls and bodies. Because if you do not uh, pledge your allegiance to the king here as the new leader of the Church of England, then of course you're a traitor. But if you do do that, according to Thomas More, who's a devout Catholic and now a saint, you will end up uh, sacrificing your soul. All right, so one benefit for the king here besides the power is that he seizes church lands, which are now taxable, and he has his collateral for his nation and his finances. Also, you might wonder, 
What are the theological differences between Rome and the new Church of England? Well, there's not honestly that many. They still believe in transubstantiation or the miraculous transformation of the uh, bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. They also believe in the confessional. They believe in just about all, I, I believe they believe in all of the uh, sacraments that the church did as well, the big seven, but they don't believe in having to have celibate priests. And obviously the big change is no more Pope. Instead, it's the king and the Archbishop of Canterbury who run the Church of England. Well, let's see what happens next and how Henry the Lady Killer is going to end up proceeding from here because, boy, this guy's got a fun love life. All right, so Catherine of Aragon, of course, uh, she is not going to go along with any of this stuff. He will, She will uh, say that she will not give him a divorce, and so it will take the legal proceedings to get rid of her and a new church to get rid of her. Talk about going down in flames of glory, right? Well, she will get uh, sent to a nunnery and be forced to retire there. Meanwhile, she will have the daughter, Mary I, who will later become Queen, aka Bloody Mary, in order to reassert uh, Catholicism in England, which is going to lead to some issues, of course, in religious warfare. Then we have Anne Boleyn, who is going to um, end up having some issues here as well with the king, as she is unable to produce a male heir. She produced a female heir, the greatest monarch in European history, or one of them anyway, Elizabeth I. But people of England, as well as the king, thought that she must be an incestuous witch if she can't have a boy, because it's obviously her fault and not the king's if she's not having a boy. And so she'll end up being beheaded for all of this stuff and uh, under trumped up charges of treason, witchcraft, and incest, she'll be sent to the scaffolds and have her head removed. But while she's being publicly beheaded, the king is going to um, play one of his favorite pastimes, which is tennis. He'll be playing at an indoor tennis court while his wife is being beheaded. What a guy, right? But from it, of course, we get the greatest monarch in European history. No offense to our current Queen Elizabeth II, but you pale by comparison to Queen Elizabeth I. Challenge me, YouTube. Let me know what you think. We, I think we can all agree Queen Elizabeth I is way cooler. All right, and then Jane Seymour is going to be next. Now, Jane um, was another saucy little minx that was on the side, another little mistress that Henry was devoted to even before Anne was dead. And so he and Jane are going to end up having themselves a uh, little love affair that will produce Edward VI as his son. And he, of course, will become king because he's the only male heir, the only legitimate male heir to the throne. Now, she's going to die, though giving birth to Edward VI, so that doesn't go so well. So Henry's going to orchestrate a marriage between he and a princess of Cleves, which is over in modern-day Germany. And in order to orchestrate this thing, I mean, he hadn't even met the girl yet. He just says, yeah, let's do this thing. There were actually two sisters to choose from, and he's like, I'll take that one. I don't even know who she is. When she shows up on the wedding day and he lifts the veil to see her face, he was appalled by the pockmarked face, and she was ugly as sin. Which is kind of silly, because I mean, she, the painter in this painting made her look pretty good, but in reality, I guess she was quite hideous. And so, Henry was repulsed, and he was unable to consummate. That was his claim to his own church, saying, since he was unable to consummate, they were unable to have sex, therefore it's an annulment. And you know, at this point in his life, though, Henry was probably starting to suffer from impotence. So it's probably not that she was ugly. It's probably more that he was impotent and couldn't get the job done, so to speak. So he'll get rid of her after six months. Then he's going to get uh, Catherine Howard as his fifth wife before his divorce with Anne was even finalized. All right, so he wasn't even finalizing that one yet. Uh, but the fact is that uh, she was only 15, okay? She was the 15-year-old daughter of Edmund Howard, and Catherine is the cousin of Anne Boleyn. This is getting a little weird, right? So this old dude, he's getting pretty old at this point, probably impotent as well, and he marries this saucy little minx who's 15, and she already, you know, she had some things going on with this guy named Francis Derham, um before the marriage, and now all of a sudden, she is bored with this king, can't seem to get any excitement out of him, and she decides to start striking it up once again with Francis Terraham, and their debaucherous little love affair will lead to her legitimately being told she is a traitor uh, for her adultery, and she will be executed in 1542, leaving Catherine Parr as our final lovely lady-in-waiting. And Henry, at that point, is so old, so gout-ridden, so ugly, so 
decrepit and fat that he can hardly waddle around, and so Catherine Parr will act really more as a nurse than anything else for this man. Now, you know, he was formerly a fit king. Uh, just some fun facts to end his life here. He, uh, at the end of his life, is going to have some declining health because at the age of 45, he had a jousting accident which severely wounded his leg, made it very difficult for him to walk. At this point, too, he's got the rich man's disease of gout. He's got bleeding gums. He's got ulcers all over his body. He's definitely impotent. His waistline expanded from uh, his waistline expanded 17 inches over the course of four years. That is a fat dude who is just growing by leaps and bounds, all right? And so uh, when he'll end up dying, they will bury him in a lead coffin. Now, at one point, you know, something went wrong in the whole uh, process of trying to get him in the coffin, and his belly started to puff as they were stuffing him in there. Uh, and his stomach actually uh, burst. There were so many gases inside his decomposing body uh, that it actually burst. And the coffin lid, the lead coffin lid, actually popped open during his burial ceremony. And people had to run frantically from the church because it smelled so bad. Isn't that fun? Now, I don't know if you recall this from our discussion before on William the Conqueror. Same thing happened to him. Yeah, that's the sign of a good leader, maybe. Or is it? Because the question is, is all really fair in religious love and war? Well, some questions for us to consider today is, you know, did Henry's time here as king really help England? Did it help Europe? Because if you consider the background of Henry's reign, with things like the Lutheran Reformation going on, uh, as well as Calvinism, Zwingliism, all the different Protestant faiths starting to burst up in Europe at this time, but then also the Civil War that led to the Tudors taking the throne in 1485, is Henry preventing another War of the Roses by legitimizing his succession? Is he? I mean, is he promoting stability? Was Henry breaking from the church in Rome because he viewed it as his responsibility to maintain stability in his realm? Or is he just a bandwagon Protestant who hoped to gain power and status under the pretext of religious reformation? And finally, is he really about the European balance of power? Or is it about Henry's lusty personal life? So what do you think? Is he a great king who did great things and established a great religion? Or was he doing this out of personal gain and lust? You debate, you decide.